GoXLR is dead. Long live Rode. Rode just dropped three new devices that are huge for content creators and streamers alike, and honestly, anyone at home that just wants high quality audio and video. I was blown away with these releases, and I'm lucky enough that Rode actually reached out to send me some of them a bit early. I wanna be clear, this video is not sponsored, and there's no expectation that I make content about this stuff. I actually had already pre-ordered one of these devices with my own money, but I still wanna talk about it because I'm really excited. There are a couple gotchas though, so make sure you stick around till the end to hear all about those. If you're not already familiar with the Roadcaster, I think it's a very important starting point. Here's my kind of dirty beat up Roadcaster Pro 2. The Roadcaster was originally released by Rode to make it easier for podcasters to have everything they need in one device. It had four XLR ports, a bunch of pads for sound effects, multiple sliders, built-in presets for high-quality podcasty and broadcasty audio, two USB ports so you can plug it straight into a computer, but very importantly, an SD card slot as well, so you can record directly on the device. Super, super handy. The Rodecaster Pro 2 introduced built-in preamps that are loud enough to drive the SM7B directly, which is insane because normally you have to spend quite a bit of money to get something to power this mic. So this device was an incredible value. But it had a couple problems. Even though it can process, manage, compress, and do all the audio stuff you need to on board, it can do that for four ports. And most streamers and content creators, and even just people at their home desk, they don't need four ports. They don't need the onboard recording, and they probably don't even need the Bluetooth functionality built in, which, by the way, super clutch. If you do things like Twitter Spaces, being able to use your Roadcaster as your input device on Bluetooth is super cool. But if you don't need all that stuff, which, let's be honest, most of us don't. Rode put out some much more compelling stuff. The two things I want to focus on most are the new Rode Streamer X and the Rodecaster Duo. Or the Rodecaster Duo is in the shot. It's actually behind me, but I have it set up perfectly for my audio right now, and it will be staying in my desk setup for a long time. So I, I didn't feel like removing it. I'll be sure to throw some fancy B-roll in so you can see what it looks like more directly. But uh, yeah, even the box is smaller than the Rodecaster Pro, so... Easy win. What the hell is this thing? The Streamer X is super interesting. I wanna be very clear going in that I've had some bugs with it. I've been talking with Rode, they're on it, but I don't wanna give a, like, a formal review just yet until some of my problems have been resolved. This thing is super handy. You might notice that there's a little button there that's different though. It's a video button. Why is there a video button on an audio interface? because it's an HDMI capture card too. This is a very interesting device. It has, I would argue, two main use cases built in. Case one is you're a video game streamer like an Xbox or PlayStation player, and you wanna have a nicer mic and capture that console into your computer alongside your webcam to do streaming. You have HDMI out for the through, so you can still connect to a TV, but you can also capture on device, which means you can capture on your computer. Super handy for turning anything with an HDMI signal into a capturable feed you can throw into OBS, you can throw into Zoom, Discord, whatever else. But that's not what I would use this for. I would use this to capture a camera like the one I'm shooting on now. It can do 4K 30 just fine, which is the best resolution for the vast majority of creators. So if you want to use your fancy Sony camera on your computer, this is a great way to do it. The reason most people are grabbing this though isn't the video, it's the audio. Because this thing can do Oh, this thing can push a lot of decibels for not a very big size. It has a power port in it, but you don't need to use that if you push enough juice from your PC. You can just plug in the one port for your computer or the two ports for two computers if you have a two PC setup. Very, very, very convenient. But the XLR, that guy's powerful enough to drive this. So it's one little device you can drop on your desk, control your gain and such on it. You're good to go. There are some negatives I'll get to at the end, but really want to focus on what's great about these devices first. So what about the Duo? The Rodecaster Duo is good enough that it is what I'm recording on right now. It's literally just a smaller Rodecaster Pro. I am hyped on this. I only use one XLR port. I don't need four. I do need the Bluetooth functionality though, and I love the onboard recording. I mean, I'm using it right now. My PC's off and I'm still able to record videos. It's so handy. So what makes this thing special? Well, it's 500 bucks and you don't need to buy preamps and it has everything you need built in. The audio quality, even just using the presets is incredible. The Rodecaster Duo is the easiest recommendation in the world for creators that wanna take their craft and their audio a little bit more seriously. It's 
pretty hard to beat a device that you can plug any XLR mic into and it will, for better or worse, just work. They also just added the functionality to connect your wireless Rode mics to it directly. So if you have those lav mics you just clip on your shirt, do you know how handy it would be to rock that in here? It is such a cool idea and I am really, really hyped that Rode is pushing the limit of what you can do on your interface. Overdue. I think Rode actually was trying hard to understand the streamer market better. They saw that GoXLR was a thing, obviously. What I don't think they expected was the number of streamers and creators like myself who bought this $700 giant, gigantic fucking interface. Like, I shouldn't need this. It takes up a third of my desk. I am so excited for this to not be on my desk anymore. Realistically, for the functionality I need, this little guy's fine. And it makes so much sense why they're finally putting these out now. And I think they put the extra time in to make sure they got them right. But that doesn't mean everything's right. Let's talk about my complaints with the Streamer X. Again, they're working on the firmware. I'm excited for the updates. But I had a handful of problems where this would freeze and not unfreeze. So like half the time I tried to take a meeting, I couldn't get my mic activated or deactivated. I used the mic mute unmute a lot. So that was super inconvenient. Usually unplugging and plugging it back in would work. And apparently Rode hasn't seen this for anyone else. So it might be something to do with my weird window setup. I didn't try it on any other computers, but be warned, there is possibly some instability here. The big thing I want to complain about though is the interface on it. Half of the things on here aren't necessary and the other half are too inconvenient. My biggest complaint is this video button and this gain knob. You'll never touch either of these. You tune your gain in just right and then you leave it. The only reason you'd ever want to touch this knob is you're switching mics around. If anything, this being here is a problem because you could accidentally hit it and change your audio levels. You don't wanna do that. It's actually pretty hard to change the gain on all of these other Rode devices. I have no idea why they backpedaled it here. It's strange. This video mute button feels like it's just there to highlight the fact that it's a video device. It, you'll never want to disable video on the HDMI side here. It just doesn't make sense. There's so many other ways to disable video that are more sensical. I, I'm confused by it. If anything, it's an annoying piece because now I have another part of my chain when I can't get a video signal that I have to worry about and debug. I, I just, both of these could have been removed or used for other things. The other piece that I, I just wish this had was a better way to see your current levels. I guess this isn't technically a roadcaster, but on the other similar devices, there's a screen and it shows you your levels. It's so nice to know on the roadcaster how loud it thinks you're being because that's what the recording is going to sound like. And if Windows is being annoying, which it often will be, that's really handy. I wish they didn't put these things on it. They gave me a better way to know if my levels are bad or not. And the complaint I have for all the devices, I can't control this mute from my computer. So I can't use a stream deck or anything else to control what's on here. This is its own isolated ecosystem. I get why they did that, but especially now with the Unify software, feels weird. Also, I didn't play with the Unify software much. I hate software side controls for devices like this. The whole reason I like them is I don't have to worry about Windows destroying my audio. So this having the fancy Unify program to control like five channels and all that, I don't care. I don't want any of that. So if that's what you're interested in, watch someone else's review. I'm not talking about any of that right now. What about the Duo? I'm going to start with complaints that exist across the Duo as well as the Roadcaster Pro and then end with some things that are specific to the Duo. The first thing, and I want to be really loud and annoying about this one because it's pathetic. The power button sucks. That's the case for the Duo and the Pro. It's this weird, awful, mushy red button that has terrible feedback and then it takes a bit to turn on. So you press it. You don't see anything for five seconds. You don't know if you actually hit it or not. You go back to hit it again and suddenly it starts turning on before you even press. It's horribly bad. It's it's a joke. And it's like behind the device awkwardly. You have to reach behind your whole setup for it. And you're going to turn it off at the end of the day because it's so bright and annoying, especially the screen. You can control the brightness, but it's just no. It should be way easier to turn this thing off and on, even if it was just a switch on the side or something. I, I hate the power button on these devices. I don't know how it is so bad. The other thing I mentioned before is the inability to control your roadcaster from software. I know I just said I want the whole thing to be on device, but it has MIDI trigger support the other way where I can press a pad and it triggers a MIDI note on the computer. Why can't I trigger 
MIDI on here to mute and unmute or control other signals on the device. It's really annoying that the mute switch on your roadcaster lives in its own world and you can't trigger or untrigger that from software. It'd be really nice if I could just use my Stream Deck for all those types of basic things and have it synchronized across my system someday. The other big problem, and I haven't seen many cover this, once you get into the high gain regions, you start to have some static. The first way this manifests is when you turn the gain up. You'll see, especially if you unplug your XLR cable and just look at it, turn up, up over 60 dB and you'll immediately start to see some noise. This was consistent across all of the Rodecaster devices I have to test. I also noticed that when you turn on phantom power, it goes away, which means that this is almost certainly something to do with the Revolution Pre. It still sounds incredible, and as long as you keep it under 60 dB, it's going to kill it. But even the SM7B, it feels like it's right on the line there, and I end up needing to add some gain in post, usually through software. The second way this affects things is the quality of the audio you will hear with the headphone jack built in. I'm surprised nobody else talked about this, but again, I guess this is my thing is the audio file in the room. The DAC in this sucks. If you're not familiar, a DAC is a digital to analog converter. It's the thing that takes the ones and zeros that the device works with and turns it into an analog signal that you hear. The DAC that converts the XLR to your computer into digital files, that one's solid. But the one that converts them back to audio you hear, it's a little noisy. I wouldn't listen to music on this much. It's not a great DAC. Something else I noticed with it, and this is the case across all of the devices here, is if you turn all of the XLR ports to phantom power, you get less noise on the headphone jack because it seems like all the noise is coming from the Revolution Pre's, and when you switch to phantom power, it goes past those. If you hear static in your headphones when you're recording on this, don't worry about it. It's almost certainly not in the recording. But if you want to not hear that, switch to phantom power, maybe grab a cheap preamp that you can use externally. I'm using the FET head right now, it was like 60 bucks, and it lets me get a much cleaner monitoring signal out of this device. Now we need to talk about the things that uniquely suck about the Roadcaster Duo. <laughs> Thankfully, there aren't many. This is basically just a smaller Roadcaster, but uh, man, the record button. It was not great before. Like for a lot of the buttons, it feels like they just took like drum pad material and used it for buttons, which isn't great. So here, this button's super mushy. And to stop recording, you have to like awkwardly hold it. It's not great. On the two, they moved it to the touch screen. So I have to hold a little thing in the corner that I'm now covering so I can't see if it's working or not. Take my finger off and hope it triggered the right thing. There's a lot of buttons on this device. There's no reason they couldn't put like a normal button there for that. I think that's it. Yeah, the Duo is literally just a smaller Rodecaster Pro. And that's all I wanted. I don't miss this guy at all. I will be keeping it because it is super handy when I want to record in other spaces. I was actually going to use it for this, but my disc already wired up. Man, I'm all in on the Duo. It's the easiest recommendation in the world. One more thing, and let me know if you want me to make a video on this. I already made a new mic. This is the pod mic USB. Just because it says USB doesn't mean it's only USB though. It also has an XLR port, which is fascinating. It means you can use this as an entry point for getting started with high quality audio and in the future, add something like a Streamer X or the Duo to your setup to get some higher quality audio out of it. I've just barely started playing with this. I've been too busy redoing my desk and preparing for a big move. But, uh, but if you do want to dedicate a video for this $200 powerhouse of a mic, let me know and I'll be sure to get that out ASAP. But for now, my setup's in a pretty stable place. If you want to talk about anything else in the audio space, please bring it up in the comments. I haven't got to flex my audio engineering background for a while, so it's always fun to do that. If you want to learn more about craziness in the camera world, I'll pin a video about that in the corner here. Thank you guys as always. Peace, nerds.